Hello, Harold. Hello, Karina. Okay, I turned off my cell phone. <laughs> Good. Here I am. Good. Okay. We already got a lot of people. Tonight's going to be fun. Great. They can cool. hear let them in. Can hear us now. No, no, I have to let them in, but we already have about 10 people in the waiting room, so. Good. Okay. And we'll probably go a little bit beyond eight, it seems to me. That's oh. what I think, yeah. And also tomorrow I'm going to send you five pages from my book because there are further things for composers in the weeks ahead. Oh, great. Um, I was also thinking um, you maybe give, since we have so many new people, you could give like a tiny bio of yourself. I will. I will. Uh, it's seven o'clock. You want to let them in? Let's do it. Let's do it. You contact Gladys and Howard. I did. Great. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Let's just give it one more minute, Harold, to just get some some latecomers, if you don't mind. We should, wait, we should wait two or three minutes because we have so many people awesome. who are not right there yet. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Harold. Hi, Michael. Hi, Kevin. I Hi. see people I don't know. Welcome. Hello, Valerie. Hello, Kit. Richard Cohen. Dane. Is it Dane Madrigal? Hi, yes, Dane. Nice to see you. Aida Shirazi, am I pronouncing that correctly? Hello. Hello. A lot of people joining. This is going to be great. Hi, Chia. Hi, Betty, Christine, Jack, Latina, Albert. Hi, Rick. Megan Wu, is that right? Megan, Megan. Who am I leaving out? I don't know. Connor. Welcome. So Harold, you asked how you'll see everybody. So once this screen fills up, you should see an arrow on the right hand side that says one yes. out of two. Do you see that? That's how you'll get to everyone else. Because we got multiple pages of people here. I don't see an arrow. I see something that like a <laughs> smud. I don't know. All right, everybody. Really we got a good okay. chunk of everybody. So I'm gonna get uh get done with everything that I have to say real quick, and then I will pass the mic over to Harold. Thank you all for joining us today. As we start the new year with a new session, um, Harold today is presenting Writing for Choir One, the beginning of a few week series that we'll talk about composing for um, choirs, for choral music. Um, there are so many of us, so we do have everyone on mute. This is just to minimize any background noise. Um, but, you know, if you've been in our sessions, you know that Harold loves to talk and answer quest take questions. So please, if you have a question, just raise your hand. Um, if you need to discuss with Harold, just simply hold your finger down. That will unmute you. And then when you release, you'll go back on mute. If that doesn't work on your computer, there is a microphone at the bottom left hand corner of your um, computer screen, and that will unmute you. Just remember to put yourself on mute when you're not talking again just to uh, minimize any feedback or extra background noise. There will be a live Q&A at the end of today's session, like every week. Uh, this is open to anybody. If you have any questions, just raise your hand and Harold will call on you. Um, additionally, um, since this is about composition, if you would like to ask a question about an original choral composition that you have, you can send that composition in PDF form to me the email is um, cantacorum.virtuosi.inc at gmail.com. And we can present um, your composition with a question that you have for Harold. But please only send the page pertaining the question that you have, if possible. Um, beyond the Q&A today, um, Harold has, you know, if we run out of time, or if you have any questions that come up throughout the week, Harold is offering free conducting and composing sessions throughout the month of January sessions with privately. And to set something up, you can email him at haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com and he'll set up a meeting time with you. Um, I will be sending over some more information about the organization and about Harold to the chat box. Um, feel free to mold us over at your, at your leisure. This information includes a donation link. Harold is giving all of these sessions completely free to the public. So um, any donations go to supporting his two New York-based choirs, um, the non-for-profit non organization that um, takes care of these. And these donations are tax deductible. 
In the chat box, there will also be my email. Once again, you can use this email or the chat box privately if you need any technological assistance throughout the session. And lastly, we will be recording this, archiving the video, so you'll have the opportunity to revisit the material whenever you'd like. We will send you the video link to your email after the meeting today, so take a look out for that uh, in the morning. And so I will pass it over to Harold. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy. Welcome everybody. This is exciting. I love working with composers. And uh, just, uh, just for those who are new to this, uh, let me just focus in. You can of course read my bio at haroldrosenbaum.com. But in terms of <clears throat> working with composers, um, I've, uh, believe it or not, over the course of my career, I've received unpublished choral scores from over 12,500 American composers, some from, from composers abroad also. And I've gone through every one, I've looked at every one, and I've chosen maybe 100 or more to perform and record. Um, I've commissioned 110 composers and have conducted about 575 world premieres uh, many, many of the times I did that, I had the composers at the rehearsals. And uh, so uh, I, I, um, I've also given lectures at the ASCAP headquarters in New York City for composers and American Music Center before they merged with Meet the Composer to form New Music USA. So I just love working with composers. There's a lot of talent out there, obviously. It's unending. And um, so what we're going to do is I wrote this little book, this, um, I guess it was April or so during the <clears throat> beginning of the pandemic. Um, it has not been published yet. I might not publish it, but we're going to use this book uh, now. Karina is going to share the screen. Instead of me just talking, you can actually see my notes, you know, the segment of the book that I'm dealing with. And then uh, why don't you put that up there, Karina? And then uh, we can just move right along, straight forward, straight, you know, straight uh, from beginning to the end. Uh, we, we might not get to the end. I also have um, <clears throat> my own published book. And in here, there is a chapter about working with composers. So I have additional information. And we do have three weeks of this. Uh, next week, I'm just continuing with this. And uh, the week after that, the uh, 19th, I have four professional singers coming on to give their views about, you know, how for, for composers, their tips for, for composers. It's really a pretty comprehensive, uh, th you know, three, three part series. And of course, I, once again, um, if you, if you want to talk privately to me, no charge, you know, just email me, we'll set up a time. Okay, so I'm going to sort of not read every, no every word here, that's silly. Uh, why don't you, um, I yeah. Um, there is a link to his published book that he just showed you, um, not this one that we're looking at on the screen, in the chat. So if you are interested in purchasing that book, the, you'll have a direct link there. Thank you. Um, let's look at, let's just scroll down to the texts, the, the second, uh, the bold texts. And yeah, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, talk and talk and talk. But if you have a question, again, just feel free. I mean, we'll save, you can save your questions to the end, or if you're not clear about something I'm saying or want to add something to it, uh, feel free to raise your hand, or, and uh, Karina will see your hand raised and she'll unmute you or something like that. Okay. Uh, is, your pub, is your text in the public domain? If not, you can receive permission to use it. But some, you know, sometimes um, if it's not, it's really hard to get permission and it's very expensive sometimes. So uh, then I, in the next paragraph, I say, when using a published text, make sure that if it is printed in the engraved octavo ahead of the first page of the score, it appears in the exact format it did when first published. Well, like a poem, like, you know, I'm not a poet, I'm not um, great, I'm not a great scholar of literature, but I mean, I do know that, for example, E.E. E. Cummings, correct me if I'm wrong, there, there's no capitalization, you know, everything is, uh, even proper names are lowercase. So you, you want to have it, appear as it appeared originally. Except, okay, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I except E.E. E. Cummings liked his name spelled with capital letters. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I, I'll, when I see him, I'll, I'll congratulate him. All right, thank you, Rick. <laughs> For whom are you writing? Uh, let's go down. I mean, this is, this is all pretty obvious. You know, once we get through this little section, 
I'll, I'll have very uh, detailed tips that you might not have thought of. Um, obviously, if you're writing, you know, you want if it's, to, if it's, if it's a women's chorus, you don't want to write SATB, that kind of thing. You might want to challenge yourself and write for, you know, 16 parts, as you see there in the fourth line. But you just have to make sure the chorus can, can handle it, you know. Um, I've, I've had a, a lot of pieces, a lot of commissioned pieces, maybe uh, 20 of them were written for 16 different parts. Of course, it's always tricky. Think of it. If, if one person is sick, I've had the really, really good fortune to never have anybody who was, you know, sick and couldn't, couldn't come to the concert. So I, I never, that, could you imagine? Um, I mean, I've had people come with 103 fever. Um, and, uh, you know, people who have bad colds and stuff, but it's, so it's a, it's a, it's tricky to write for 16 parts, unless it's a chorus of 48 people, three and a part, then go for it. Um, yeah, the next paragraph talks about, you know, the, the level of difficulty. Uh, let's just skip over that. Uh, yeah, um, the size of the choir, uh, wait, one more second. Um, yeah, stop, stop, stop. Are you right, willing and able to switch your fundamental style? Yeah. In other words, um, should you dummy down when writing for a chorus? I know a lot of composers, you know, like Pulitzer Prize winning composers, great, you know, great composers who have a, a very difficult, you know, difficult style, I mean, style, uh, complex style when they write for orchestra, but and some of them don't dummy down and some do. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a better term for dummy down, but if you want your music to be sold, then I think the easier it gets, the more chance you have of that. I look at, uh, I know a piece by <clears throat> um, George Pearl. I mean, I okay, I know uh, a very complex piece of his, which I've done called Sonnets to Orpheus, but he also wrote Christmas, a Christmas carol that is really nice and completely tonal. So you just have to think about uh, the level of difficulty you want, the level of difficulty your commissioner wants and all that kind of thing. Okay, why don't we just move down? I wanna to get to some of the, the range. And let me just talk about ranges for a minute. I mean, you, you, can, all, you can look this up, <clears throat> but let me give my take on it. Um, so, and whether, whether it's a college, I won't say high school, let's say college and up. I mean, in other words, this applies to some colleges, but certainly professional courses and very, very good volunteer courses of which there are thousands in the world. Um, sopranos, middle C to A, an octave and a sixth above that. Well, of course, if you write a, a you know, a, a, an a, a, a sharp or a B flat, you know, most singers who can hit an A can sing a B flat, but just be careful. When you get out of this range, you have to be careful. That's all I'm saying. Altos, F below middle C, yeah. You know, most altos have an F. To see an octave above it, well, yeah, of course, but most of them have a, above that too. But these are the safe ranges, tenors D, perhaps C. I know one, I know a, a wonderful tenor, <clears throat> won't mention names, even though all I can do is compliment him. He used to be in my New York Virtuoso Singers. Uh, I was sorry to lose him, he moved away, but he did not have a low C sharp. His lowest note was D and barely, it was barely there. Just something to keep in mind. Um, basses, F, yeah, but not for high school choirs, right? You might not get any basses with Fs. Um, you know, nine out of 10 singers in this, low singers in this country are male singers, are baritones, so low in quotation marks, and uh, maybe 10% are real basses, as opposed to in Russia, it's probably just the opposite for whatever reason. All right, anyway, then this the children's range. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that right now, but let's go down, uh, Karina. Let's keep going down a minute. Uh, yeah, try to avoid having singers. No, I'm sorry, go up again a little bit. <clears throat> Try to avoid having singers enter pianissimo or three piece on one of the highest, if not the highest note in their cachet, especially on a soft vowel. 
it's equally hazardous and uncomfortable for the singers to sustain that note for an inordinate amount of time. That's really dangerous. That can really sap their strength. So, you know, if it's the last piece in the program and you don't care if they can't sing any other piece, then <laughs> go for it. But it's really difficult. You know, like Handel's Dixie Dominus is difficult because of, there are like, I forget the number, but there are like 12 high B flats and 52 high A's and they're dun, 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 dun. You know, they're just jumping all over the place. It's, it's hard to, uh, to sing uh, sustained notes high up, very difficult. It just saps their strength, uh, vocal strength. Uh, and speaking of, you know, vocal stamina uh, in the recording studio, I'm, I'm uh, so getting off topic just a bit, but in the recording studio, it's always best not to go more than four hours a day for, a, for a, a professional singer or any singer, really. Because even though they can do five hours and they can do six hours, you know, there's, you know, sometimes you can really hear that it's a little bit more difficult and the voice sounds a little bit more tired. Let's go down, glissandos. Well, here, this is really interesting because every single time I see a, a glissando marking a diagonal line, I asked the composer uh, exactly where the glissando should start. And I get different answers. Uh, in other words, sometimes there is a glissando that starts on one note and continues all the way to the next note. But then when I ask them, they say, well, it should start halfway through. So if you have a, a whole note glissando and you want it starting halfway through, make it a half note tied to a half and start the glissando on the second half note, that kind of thing. Uh, let's just skip down. I don't want to belabor that point. Osseas. Yeah, well, you, you know, osseas is um, a small note. So let's say the base, the base note is low C. That's, that's like a death wish if you write a piece with a, um, a low C, and it has to be low C because they went down an octave. <laughs> like, uh, like in the Rachmaninoff Vespers, there's one movement actually where it starts on a B flat. And it goes down an octave. Dun, 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 dun. But of course, it's an octave lower than that. So you have to get uh, somebody with a real low B flat. But anyway, um, generally speaking, if you want a low D for the basses, and it can work with that note on an octave higher, where you, you switch parts and have the tenor, you know what I mean? Just put OCR, uh, which means um, if you can't. If they can't do that note, uh, OCR means uh, an alternative note that they can do. Okay, divisi. This is an interesting concept because um, the uh, I see this all the time, and I and I I work this out, or my my contractor Nancy works this out. Uh, one who hires my professional singers, and she distributes the voices. And she asks my opinion all the time, most of the time, and sometimes I let her do what she feels is right. For, and what am I referring to? So what if the sopranos divide, but the altos don't? Let's say you have a chorus of 16 people, the sopranos divide uh, and the altos don't. So you're gonna have two sopranos on the top note, two sopranos on the next to the top note and four, and four altos on the bottom. That might not work out. You know, it might not balance at all. I mean, it won't. It won't balance. But the thing is, if the altos have the melody, for example, in Russian music, the alto and the bass have. Let me think. Is that true? Yeah, the alto and the bass are more important than the soprano and tenor. So very often there'll be an alto melody, and the other parts are accompanying. And in, in that case, um, yeah, the sopranos can be lighter, and you can have, you know, two and two, and then four altos. But generally speaking. You might want to have uh, three sopranos, well, three people on top, two in the middle, and three on bottom for more of a balance. Or um, you can put three on top, three in the middle, and three on bottom if you use one tenor to, to sing the alto, the printed alto part. So it just depends on the nature of the piece at that time, the, uh, the nature of, of the, uh, the section, that measure. Uh, it's not so easy. I always, always, always uh, think about this and, and don't pass over it. Um, okay, let's go down to the next. Um, yeah, let's not bother with that. Let's talk about glottal stops. Well, this is not something composers might, you know, this is not something composers necessarily think about, but 
um, it seems to me, this is interesting, I think, it seems to me that if you, that you should be the master of your composition. And if you really want the text to be heard, and since I believe most conductors, most choral conductors don't pay as much attention to glottal stops as they should, then you should put in the preface of the music what, what you want. Now, let me just explain for, for those few of you, if any of you who don't know what a glottal stop is, it's when the vocal cords come together for a fraction of a second, stopping the flow of air. Flow, flow of air, flow of air, flow of air, like a mini cough. <laughs> so I, I mean, there's so many times, and I give some examples here um, where a glottal is not used. The fifth line here, it says, for example, as it was in the beginning, most even professional singers would, would like to do as it was in the, as it was in, it was in, was in. And um, no, I tell them I'd like glottals or for unto us, for unto, for unto, that's what they do. I'm not just professionals. I mean, a lot of, a lot of professionals won't do that, but certainly most amateurs <clears throat> And all high school students, probably, I don't know. No offense to you high school teachers. I mean, I was a high school student once myself and I'm sure I went for unto, and uh, yeah, for, for unto us, love us all, will sound like love us all, love us all. Anyway, you know, you can have a beautiful legato and sing with glottals. And glottals, if they're done judiciously and gently, will not damage your vocal cords. Okay, let's go down. Uh, you know, so you might, I'm putting these things in wait, stop there, go back up a little bit, sorry. These are some of the things you might want to, you know, advise the conductors with. For example, towards the bottom, there's a single line, do not sing high notes louder just because they are higher on the staff. I mean, this is in line with the concept of, you know, singing the way you would speak it. So, um, and with his stripes, and with, and with his stripes, no, and with his stripes, you see, don't sing the highest note louder just because it's higher on the staff. Let's go, let's go, uh, oh, here's one. Well, we can go, we can skip over a lot of this because I want to get to the, um, the nitty gritty, the details. Let's, let's scroll down. Notation, expression marks, yeah, uh, look, uh, again, you might think, well, don't, don't bother reading this now, I'm just talking, but uh, you might think you want to just leave it to the conductor, leave everything to the conductor. I think that's a bad idea. I think you'll be disappointed. Most composers nowadays put, um, you know, a lot of markings in, which is great. Uh, I would recommend, for example, not doing just a crescendo and decrescendo, but putting the, the dynamic at the peak of the crescendo that you actually want. In other words, if you're starting mezzo piano and you end up, you're crescendoing and then you decrescendo back to a mezzo piano, invariably somebody's gonna ask you, is the peak mezzo forte or forte? So put it in, put in breath marks. You know, some of you won't wanna do that. You wanna leave it to the conductor. But uh, I think 90% of all the compositions I've seen by contemporary composers don't put in breath marks, at least not consistently. They'll put in some or none and you're leaving it to the conductor. And I, I just think uh, you need to give them guidance because frankly, a lot of conductors would love to have that guidance. Uh, now, uh, okay, let's go down. Let's go down breath marks. Let's skip, skip breath marks because I just talked about it. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I don't want to belabor the point. Oh, hold on a second. Um, other, okay, other notational thoughts. Now here's where it gets interesting. Stop right there, thank you. Some of the following tips may not be adhered to by publishing companies which have their own editorial guidelines and policies. Until then, in other words, until you, you know, you, you get you get them your work published, or if you will be self self publishing, these suggestions seem valid and logical and make your will make your performance quite grateful and pleased, especially me, um, because I have to um, 
improve, let's say I'll, put, I'll say improve upon the scores just for my own sake. So if a system begins with a meter, which is different from that in the last measure of the preceding one, indicate the change at the end of the preceding system. And again, at, at the beginning of the new one, that's pretty standard. Don't put an eighth note equals 110 if you are in two, four time. If you're in two, four time, put in the, what the quarter note is. I mean, again, I'm, I'm assuming virtually all of these things are things that most of you know, but I just wanna make sure. Nobody wants to see quarter equals 60 if you're in six, eight time, <laughs> you know? Um, okay, so the next paragraph in an irregular meter like 11.8, yeah. Well, we've seen this. I mean, Stravinsky does this. A lot of composers will do this. They'll tell you how, um, how to conduct it, 3.3.3.2, three, 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 for example. Well, that just might be for one particular measure. What I do and what my singers really love is I have, I put triangles and then vertical lines. And if they're not sure what it is, I explain to them. So try a vertical line is, you know, a quarter note, let's say an 11, eight time, which is, uh, you know, uh, allegro, allegretto, you're not counting 11, you're not conducting 11 beats, you're conducting like da 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 so you mix, you mix it up. Uh, whenever you, whenever you want them to feel, a, you know, in three, you put a, tr a, a triangle. Um, let's go to the next paragraph. Write in, yeah, write in four four instead of four two. Um, it just makes more sense to me. I don't, I don't see the necessity. You may disagree. Next paragraph. Uh, if your tempo is in th uh, three quarter time, in extremely slow, perhaps quarter equals thirty consider changing the meter to 6-4 because not all conductors are savvy enough to subdivide. You know, if it's three quarter time and you say quarter equals 30, chances are you're gonna conduct it, you know, one and two and three and. Now 6-4 six, is six, four is not the same as subdivided three. We know that, you know, in 6-4 you have, you're giving six beats that are all the same size, but you know, if you can do it um, in six four, or you, you know, or in the footnote, tell them to subdivide. If it's in three quarter time, tell them to subdivide. Whatever, but just uh, try to help the conductor. Um, yeah, most multisyllable words. The next paragraph. You know, look it up in the dictionary to see how they should be divided. <laughs> or go to that uh, that link, because, for example. Um, you know, like if you have a word like together, uh, well, that's not a good example. Maybe uh, bookend. I mean, I don't think you want to have B O O dash K E N D. That would be on Halloween. Maybe you want to put that, but not not. Uh, it would confuse people. All right, next. When using, okay, when indicating triplets, this is a biggie for me um, because I know that I'm not a, you know, I'm not a professional editor. I don't know the exact rules that publishers use. I think when the stems go up, you put a bracket, but when they go down, you don't bother or something like that, I forget. But in, in any case, I like, to, I like to see a, if it's a triplet, the number three in a bracket, whether it's you know an angled bracket or a curved bracket, I just like to see the bracket right away. It's one less function the brain has to do, you know, because uh, if it's not there right away or if it's sort of hidden under, you know, next to the text on bottom, you can't quite see it in time. You're going to think that's uh, three quarter notes instead of a quarter note triplet, and that just takes a little extra effort, and that's not that's not good. When it's really complex music. You don't want to have to waste time with any extra efforts. If you next paragraph, if you want a note to be held for four beats and four four time, do not tie it to an eighth notes. This is um, something I've been trying to get get composers to think about for many many years. Ever since I um, encountered my uh, good friend, now good friend, when I first met Thea Musgrave, it was in the the music building at Queens College. And I posed this question to her. I said to her, why do I see whole, in 4-4 four, four time whole notes 
tied over to eighth note, to an eighth note, when it's obvious it should just be for four beats and not four and a half beats. And she leaned forward and said, it's a stupid British tradition. And she can say that because she's British. Anyway, um, some people say, well, and they start saying, well, if, if it's, it ends with a consonant as opposed to a vowel, I mean, that makes no sense. Or they say, well, they want to make sure the singer holds it for four beats. That's crazy. You know, it's crazy. If a singer sees a whole note, they should hold it for four beats in four, four time. And if they don't, you tell them to in rehearsal. But what if a composer chooses to have a whole note tied to an eighth here and then four pages later, uh, well, here, and they want it to be held for four beats, but four pages later, they have a whole note tied to an eighth and they want the singer to cut off on the end of one. They're screwed because there's no difference in the notation. Just so let's go on. Let's go to the next paragraph. Um, okay, let me see. Oh, just the next paragraph. I was looking. I want to do something here. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It is. Okay. Great. Yeah. Be specific with dynamic markings by placing them, you know, exactly above where you want them to be executed. I talked about the next sentence. I talked about. Uh, in other words, sometimes. Just like a new metronome, a new metronome indication in the middle of a piece might go a half an inch or a fourth of an inch to the, too far to the right to be recognized as wanting it to be exactly on the beat, for example. Now, for example, um, if you have like, you know, like Beethoven, <clears throat> instead of just Andante and, you know, Allegro, he has Andante, Mano Anthropo, and then he goes on and on. If you have a two or three English or Italian tempo description, and then you put the quarter equals 60 or whatever it is, after that, that metronome marking might appear at the end of the first measure, or even in the second measure. So I would put the metronome marking right under the uh, description on, the, on beat one where you want it to happen. Next paragraph, do not write supito piano, sim simply indicating piano is sufficient. Uh, you know, you can, you can do that if you've been, if the singers have been singing forte for quite a while, but you know, I, I never mistake piano for anything but be piano exactly where piano is marked. Um, you, you may not agree with everything I'm saying, but uh, just, you know, you can ask me later. Uh, the singer's reaction, yeah, okay, next paragraph in four, to, in four, four times. Yeah, in four, four time, the end of a crescendo occurs on the downbeat. The, I'm sorry, the end of a decrescendo occurs on the downbeat. A half rest follows and the chorus enters at mezzo piano. Are you assuming that when the singers released the note before the half rest, they looked ahead and therefore ended on that level? You know what I mean? If you want, a mezzo piano at the end of a decrescendo, don't put it on the next entrance. Because I, as a conductor, I, I might say, let's say the crescendo started at mezzo piano and, and I, I wanted a forte on the peak of the crescendo. And then you have a, a decrescendo with no marking except on the following entrance, you have mezzo piano. Maybe I would say to myself, maybe it should be mezzo forte at the end of the decrescendo. Just be specific, just be specific. If you want the next line, the next paragraph, if you want the bass line to stand out when all the upper parts are active, it is possible that placing a dynamic mark just one level above the others will not be sufficient. So take a little extra time to figure out and notate desired dynamics throughout your composition so that little or no adjustments need to be made by the conductor in actual practice. Of course, it depends on the acoustics and the nature of the ensemble. And, and some composers will put the same dynamic entrance for the basses as the other parts and say, uh, let me think, um, whatever the Italian expression is for, uh, I think it's, oh, it's French, it's on E-N-D-E-H-O-R-S or something like that, me meaning to stand out. Or they might say da lontano for the other parts, which means from afar, but just be a little more specific if you can. Um, 
which leads me to talk about a little bit about uh, Bach um, and fugal entries. Uh, there, there are times when I have three different levels of dynamics simultaneously, depending on who I want to stand out at any given time. If you want the, oh, I did that. Uh, next one, be careful with the notation of decrescendo signs that carry over from one page or system to another. Yes, I've seen this even in uh, engraved music. I'll say that again, because that's a little, let me slow down. Be careful with the notation of decrescendo signs that carry over from one page or system to another, ending on the first note in the measure. It should be long enough at its last moment so that it does not look like an accent mark. So it would help to place it in its proper place slightly to the left of the note and maybe elongate it somehow. If you want to use these descriptive words, oh yeah, in addition, uh, yeah, I said that already. If you want a new tempo to command somewhere, somewhere in the measure besides a downbeat, you may wish to have vertical dotted lines extending down to the top of the top staff to indicate the exact moment it begins, especially if it occurs on a rest. This is something that's really tricky. Um, you know, there are pieces by Brahms, for example, where it's a new tempo beginning on the upbeat. So people might not get that unless that's indicated nicely. Don't write the words a tempo if you mean tempo primo. I've seen that mistake. You know, after a retard, you can write a tempo, meaning, you know, it's the it's the tempo that it was right before the retard. But if you if you want it to be the tempo of the opening of the piece, which is very different from what there was after that, I've seen that mistake. That's why I'm saying that. Most of you, I'm sure, would not make that mistake. Um, when a tempo changes, this is something I like to see, but you, you, don't, you don't see this usually in printed scores. When a tempo changes, in addition to putting the new metronome marking, write slightly slower or some immediate rec recognizable uh, wording which will enable the conductor to react and adjust the tempo more quickly. You know, if, I, if, I were, if, if I were conducting something for like eight minutes in quarter equals 84, and then suddenly I'm seeing on the page Quarter note equals 86 or 88 or 90. I'm, I might say to myself, having, let's say I didn't study this in advance, I might say to myself, is this faster or slower <laughs> than what has been happening? I just noticed the mistake. Karina, make a note, please. See that when a tempo changes, in addition to putting the new metronome marking, write slightly slower. This should, the comma should go before the quotation mark. Oh my God. See, I'm not a professional editor. Okay. So let's go down. That's no, I'm talking. <laughs> I'm talking about the the, uh, the paragraph I was just reading from. We can visit this later. Okay. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's the I, line. I got the note. I'll take okay. it. <laughs> okay. Um, not everyone can whistle well and even whistle at all, even with the aid of fingers. <laughs> you might wish to explore other non-singing sounds. You know, because per, I think. The more trained a singer is, for some reason, the more difficult it is for them to whistle. And this is something I learned from my contractor, Nancy Wirch, um, where she said, Harold, you know, <laughs> most professional singers cannot whistle well at all. I don't know why that is, but it's the same with, not the same, but it's similar with clapping. I'm, and I'm not talking about just professionals or high school kids, whatever. You can be really accurate rhythmically. And then when people start clapping, it's a mess. It just takes more rehearsal time. Um, next page, humming can be, oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, we've all seen pieces where composers want you to hum, but uh, it could be very difficult to hear that. So I've often suggested to composers that we do ooh or ah, and you know, most of them, if not all of them say, sure, whatever works. They don't really care generally because you know, there's, there's one part singing the words and the others are ooing and ahhing or humming, whatever. Um, if you want singers to whisper, make it, oh yeah, make it clear whether it should be a true voiceless one or more like a soft, like Sprechstimme. So if you want, hello, how are you? Uh, voiceless, say it. But the thing is, 
it's very difficult for the audience to hear completely you know unvoiced whispers so you might say um either sprechstimme or i think R ravel um yeah uh apena he he says apena articulata and he's french but he used the italian i believe in, in one piece which means hardly articulated that might be something a little different that's sort of like having bad diction on purpose i think he wanted there uh which is sort of hazy and mis mysterioso. That's a little, little bit different from this, but anyway, I made my point with the whispering. Um, if you want a true heavy accent, this is the next paragraph, use this, that symbol, avoid using sforzando, SF or FC when a simple- Carol, I think yeah. you have a question based on your last comment. I thought someone, I saw someone holding, holding up a screen. Oh, sure, uh, sure, question. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Whoever you are. Hi. Sorry, but just an editorial thing. You, yeah. you, it's a typo. You don't mean an alternative is to sing, T O O sing, or ah, uh, it's to sing. It, it's oh, where, just, are we, where are we now? I'm sorry. A look at the paragraph that refers to singing ooh or ah. Uh. Yes. An alternative is to sing, not to, to sing. Well, look at that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Erata. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This hey. hasn't, been, hasn't been fully. Well, I'll just call it a typo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that brings us down to the fifth paragraph. Let me skip for a moment because you said let's just call it a typo and not a errata because. Well, if you put in a sheet that has a bunch of typos. You know, that I would call an errata sheet. Exactly, exactly, I understand. Um, but let me go back to, if you want a lighter accent, place a horizontal dash below or above the note. In New York City, um, I've worked, you know, I've worked with literally hundreds and hundreds of professional choristers and to them, a horizontal, a horizontal line above a note means a slight accent. And that sideways V means a heavier accent. I know if you look it up, you know, a, side, uh, a horizontal line is tenuto, which can mean a whole little a full length or a little longer, or, you know, whatever. But that's, that's what it means to them. Just to keep it simple, you know? Um, okay, don't use obscure Italian words. This is the fifth paragraph that are completely unrecognizable, like you know, if you, if you want to do that, then put, put the uh, definition in the preface. Supply, supply a piano reduction for you, for you, for your acapella piece, if possible. Make sure to mark in the left-hand margin that it's for rehearsal only. Um, yeah. Well, uh, um, hold on. The piano part. Wait, let me just let me read it. Uh, as in the singer's lines, simplicity, unambiguity, and clarity are always preferred. That concept should also prevail in the reduction. So, if two different oh yeah, so if two different vocal lines happen to share the same note occasionally in the piano reduction, I'm saying it is not necessary not necessary to indicate that in the piano part you know, to have the upper note appear twice. You know what I'm saying, just keep it, keep it easy. Um, which brings me to something else, which I'm not sure if I have this here. Oh yes, yes, it is, it's the next paragraph. I had this with a piece that, believe it or not, I discovered by Samuel Barber and I eventually had it published. Um, and there was, uh, well, here's a, here's a little story. It's not completely relating to, completely relating to this, but uh, and I actually forget the name of the piece right now. But um, I I knew that there was one note in the score which couldn't be right, so I just changed it. It was a C, clearly a C sharp he wrote, but I changed it to a D sharp. And Shermer's Shermer's had the uh, they had the 
the good sense to contact Jean Colomanotti and ask him his opinion. He said, oh yeah, that has to be wrong. It has to be a D sharp. Anyway, that's a little side issue, but I, I do remember in that piece, uh, there was a piano reduction. Look, if, and how, if uh, th theoretically you need to have like an F sharp go into a B flat in the piano part, in the piano part, because an F sharp is part of an F sharp major chord and the B flat's part of a G flat major chord, something like that. Spare the singers, please. Don't have F sharp going to B flat when you can e just as easily have had G flat going to B flat or F sharp going to A sharp, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Okay, let's go on. Next page. Um, breath and expression marks that appear in, yeah. That is an interesting thing. You never see this in, in printed scores, which have for rehearsal purposes only, you know, for rehearsing the piano reduction. Breath and expression marks that appear in voice, but well, expression marks you might have in the piano part, but not, I don't see breath marks or, um, or you can, if the singers are breathing, if the sing, let's say the sopranos have four quarter notes and you want them to breathe after the first quarter notes, so you put a check mark or a comma above the staff and they'll know that it's a, an eighth note and an eighth rest. You should indicate that in the piano part also, if it really is just doubling for rehearsal purposes. Um, yeah, have a numeral eight. Of course, we all know that. Um, measure numbers be, belong at the beginning of each system, only not atop each measure. I've seen that. I've also seen <clears throat> um, dynamic changes. I'm, I may actually see this later on in my script, my you know script here. But if you have a tempo change for everybody, obviously, and you put it only above the soprano part then the basses are gonna be confounded when everybody starts singing faster or slower because they, they didn't see it above their own part. Now I know it can get messy. So you just have to you know, fit this concept to the situation. But, and especially when the meter changes, I've seen composers put meter changes on the very top in large letters. It's sort of like when you're going, you're traveling on the highway and it says, you know, trucks have, painted on the highway in these elongated letters, say tr trucks must leave, you know, exit must exit. And when you're looking at it, you know, with some kind of perspective, you're, you're seeing it correctly. You know what I mean? But um, I've seen that above these elongated numerals above the soprano staff and composers think that because it's elongated, it makes it really easy for the bassist or tennis to see it. It doesn't. Um, okay, here's something. This is more for a conductor than a composer. The bottom system here. Um, oh, I see. No, the next to the bottom system. Let me get to that first. Yeah, I mean, this is that's what I like to do <clears throat> uh, when I'm, especially when I'm conducting pieces for chorus and orchestra or chorus and certain instruments. You know, I just write in big letters, S A T B on every page. It's just something I like to do. I like to do other things too. Um, like, let's say you have a piece, again, for voices and instruments where on virtually every page, or even just for voices alone, virtually on every page, there's just one, syst one system. So, you, you know, let's say the piece is in eight parts and the eight parts take up one page. And then suddenly 16, 16 pages later, there's a page with two systems. So at the end of the first system, I like to have a big arrow, curved arrow pointing down, like a curved arrow pointing down. So the eye goes there and then at the end of the page, um, if the next page has two systems, I put arrows pointing to the right, like two arrows, but if it's back to one system, I'll put a curved arrow pointing up. You know, these are just things a composer actually might do to help conductors. Uh, you should also, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Wait one second, let me just think. 
I will say we have about 10 minutes left till eight, Harold. Okay, thank you. Um, there are so many things I mark in my score that are not typically there. Uh, some of these I, I've mentioned to you. Um, let me just see something. When I'm cue, when I need to cue, let's say the trumpets, they've been, you know, they've been lying low for, for like, you know, 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, so there was no need to pay any, any attention to them, but uh, a few measures before they come in, I put an arrow curved pointing to their part and I circle their entrance. That's not something a composer really can do, but I just thought I'd mention that. Um, okay, let's look at the last paragraph. Long curved lines, yeah. Other than ones that envelop one syllable for many notes have no place in choral scores, yes. Except for I've seen like Debussy and Ravel put in a long curved line two or three measures long, like in Debussy, Debussy Trois Chansons. Um, and of course, for pianists and string players, it denotes, you know, one phrase, bowing in one direction, that kind of thing. But it's really confusing, because in choral music, the curved line should only be used as a tie. And also when more than one note is used for one syllable. Um, okay. Let's, let's go to the next page. You can stop me. I'm wondering, because we can go a little bit after eight, but I'm wondering if, if people can just, can you see everybody, Karina, if people raise their hand, if they're going to ask a question, if they're going to ask a question, I want a, a lot of time for that. If nobody has any questions, I can just talk till like five after eight. Can everyone, if anyone has a question, can you just raise your hand and we'll get a little of a consensus here? Nice. That means I'm being clear and thorough. Nobody has any questions. Oh my God. That's not, that's okay. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to the page. Thank you, Karina. By the way, I just restarted a series of interviews I've interviewed 17 people already. Bob Spano, Leonard Slatkin, Osvaldo Goliov, Thea Musgrave, Ellen Tape Swillick, uh, Joan Tower, uh, Aaron J. Kernis. And uh, every two weeks, we're gonna, it's called the Choral Connection. And every two weeks we're releasing one uh, that will be edited. And there's already one up on YouTube. If you type in Thea Musgrave interview, you'll see a 30 minute interview with 92 year old Thea who is as sharp and witty as ever. And she we should, you learn, what's we that? She's, we should mention she's Scottish, not British. Did I say British? <laughs> you did, but it was, I think it was in a, in a quick passing. <laughs> yes, she's, she's definitely Scottish. And I'm also doing a choir tour to Scotland, hopefully, anybody who wants to sign up in June of 2022, but that's another question. Um, but she, she, it's interesting because she, she talks about Stravinsky and Benjamin Britten and you know Peter Maxwell David. I mean, there are so many stories that one learns when you interview somebody who's been around the biggies for so long, you know, having dinner with uh, uh, Pierre Boulez and that kind of thing. Oh, okay. So where are we? Um, long curve lines, forget that. We've talked about that uh, pretty much whatever language a piece is in, if you are giving words in addition to standard expression marks to indicate tempi, dynamics, or moods, it is best to use English or Italian. Yeah, I mean, just to make it easier for conductors. Um, uh, when in 4-4 four, four time and the rhythm is a quarter note, a dotted quarter note and three eighth notes, Detach the first eighth note from the remaining two, which span the fourth beat. Oh, I see what I'm saying here. Just to show the beat. You might not agree with that, and maybe I'm not totally right here, but there's something to think about. Let's go to the next one. I'll slow down a bit. When one part, and actually Thea talks about this. I didn't even know she was gonna talk about grace notes. 
So there's a lot of technical talk too in these interviews I'm giving. When one part begins with one or more grace notes and the other parts do not, compress the grace notes in the score as much as possible so that they don't take up an inordinate amount of space in the measure, causing the other parts first notes to appear quite far to the right of the downbeat. She talks about that exactly that and she says she tell, asks, asks her publishers to put the grace notes before the before the bar line, which is not normal. And she says she has a person she, she, who works with her and the publisher charges extra to do this little thing that's not standard. Um, yeah, here's one, the next short paragraph. After a rather long piano interlude, you may wish to notate the choir volume, even if it's, if it's the same as it was before the interlude began. Just everything I'm saying is just to make it easier for singers and conductors, because you know when you're working with a professional choir or any choir, time is money, and nobody wants to waste time. Um, well, here's one. I mean, the, the the biggest question, the most often question I hear from singers is, um, should I breathe at the comma, or when do, should I breathe after every comma? And I always say no chances are you will, but it might only be 55 or 60% of the time. So um, only breathe where the composer and or I have marked to breathe. Uh, now this is assuming that the conductor is gonna take time to indicate all your markings and the conductor's markings in addition to yours before uh, the first rehearsal into their scores and then hand out the scores or mark up your score, the conductor score. What I do is if I'm doing like the Bach motets, which I've done, I order the music. Uh, sometimes it's public domain, so you don't have to, but with generally speaking, of course, when a, a, as a living composer, I order the music. I put my uh, markings in my copy. I scan it, I send it to the singers and tell them to either transfer the markings into their score or just print it out. But they've already, I'm already making them pay for it, the full score, but they, I mean, the, the, the published score, but they might want to just print out my markings to save time so they don't have to transfer it. Harold, we have um, had a few, we've had a few questions. Um, yeah, let's stop. Let's, let's uh, Karina, let's make a note and everybody make a note where I'm stopping so we can start here next week from here. Okay, questions. If you have a question, if you have a question, feel free to just unmute yourself, um, introduce yourself, and then we have um, a, a potential score to look at if there is time, Harold. Hey, yeah, well, can you take that uh, my manuscript off and I can just see everybody, great. Okay, question. No questions. I thought there was one person that raised their hand and now I can't remember who it was. If not, we, um, someone requested to look at a score. Okay, who's that? Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, this is me, Antonio. Antonio, from, welcome. From Pelham, Westchester. Yes, that's where uh, my good friend Adam Abe's house lives. He's the greatest recording engineer in the, in the East Coast. Wow, okay. Okay. Uh, so I sent you uh, my latest uh, vocal composition. I'm, yeah, I didn't see it. Actually, I actually so, haven't gotten it yet. Do you mind um, sending it one more time? I'll email you to make sure we have the right email. Are you talking to me? Can you add? Yes. Yeah, she didn't. Yet. Oh, you didn't get it? For some Not yet. Oh, okay. Well, Pelham is far from Manhattan, and maybe that's why. <laughs> See, Brooklyn. Do you you want to, do you have a physical copy of it? You can hold the page up if I need to see something, or do you want to just describe the question? Um, no, I just, I was wondering if you could um, apply all this, the, the notions that you spoke about to a real score and, and, and maybe highlights what's, what could be improved from a, from a singer perspective, from a, a pianist accompanist perspective, from a conductor perspective, you know what I mean? 
happy, I'm happy to take time with you after this, you know, tomorrow or the next day or whatever. Okay. You can spend time to send me the whole score, send it to me. And I, I don't mind giving my email out to anybody. It's Harold Rosenbaum at gmail.com and, and we'll set up a time to send me the PDF. Anybody else? Any questions about things that aren't related to com com composers? I think um, Ida has a question. Yes, hi, Aida Shirazi. Uh, so I actually have um, I have a question about humming. Uh, at some point, I worked with a vocal ensemble. It was not a choir. It was an ensemble of four singers, and I asked them about humming and if it's possible and uh, and if it's going to actually sound and project. And one suggestion that they made was uh, maybe instead of actually humming asking the singers to uh, kind of raise the back of their tongue so it touches the roof of their mouth as if you know you want to you actually you're you you actually start kind of yawning kind of something like this like something like this they suggested oh, wow. that it might work but I was wondering if you have ever encountered this or if you think it would work or not as a as an alternative for humming I can't imagine it wouldn't work, but but uh, I'm not sure if it will project more. By the way, anybody know which piece by William Walton has that text in it? Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. It's Balshazar's Feast by William Walton. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Anyway, that's neither here or there, but I remember that from my college days a half a century ago. Okay, now. Uh, no, I don't see any problem with it. You can experiment with all kinds of things that are not hurting the vocal cords. Sure, that I can see that. I'm not quite sure. If, mm -hmm. I mean, any voice teachers here? You can answer that. That seems to be okay. I've been told to do that before, and it, it seems it definitely works better than humming. Um, I think mm -hmm. it all depends on the acoustics of the of, of the room and the place, what you know, what the purpose is and right. for how long and what the effect is. But um, I think it's it's definitely a, a good alternative to a difficult mm -hmm. uh, proposition. So sorry, when you're saying for how long, do you mean if it's too long yeah, then it might it's be tiring or something like that? Well, I, I guess I was thinking in terms of of um, how long the phrases that you would like to be hummed and like what dynamic you would like it at um you know is it is it covering up for instance a soloist because it's too loud in comparison to humming so i think depending on on the context that you know it, it, it offers a good solution karina is a singer so that she comes from experience um thank you so much it's important you're welcome it's important that composers speak up and meet with conductors if you can beforehand come to a rehearsal or two you know not to interrupt in, in rehearsals but maybe speak you know make, make notes and talk to the conductor in the break but it's, a, it's an important interaction yes somebody's raising their hand um i don't quite know your name but go ahead and unmute yourself and 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 you uh, can you can talk Philip Duval. Oh. I have a, a uh, sort of an, unauthor, uh, um, an unorthodox suggestion for Ada and a question also. Um, I did considerable study, I did a research paper on kazoos, the merlitons in general, which are methods of instrumentalizing the voice. And although a lot of people look at them as toys, I uh, wrote a song cycle once where the uh, soprano used a kazoo at times and she absolutely fell in love with the instrument <laughs> as a way it really helped her develop a sense of pitch and uh, they're not just a joke. If you're wanting to use a humming sound, there's a, that's a method that uh, even if you don't want to use it in a concert setting, it's really good for training the singers to use yes. those because you can, it will even the sound. Everybody will kind of be the same volume and everybody can really concentrate on their pitch that way. So th that's a suggestion you might want to 
think about anyway when you're working with them. It, it, you know, everybody has kind of has fun with it anyway. They they look at them as what is this, but then once they start working, they go, oh, okay, these really are instruments. So these aren't now, now before before you ask your question, I want to just uh, jump in. Believe it or not, um, I did many, many concerts with uh, the Brooklyn Philharmonic. I actually did 59 concerts with the Brooklyn Philharmonic under Lucas Force, Michael Christie, Bob Spano and others. But um, I forget the occasion, like maybe it was the 75th birthday of the Brooklyn Philharmonic, John Curliano wrote a prelude for chorus using only kazoos. It must be, I don't know if it's published, but the whole thing was just kazoos. They marched in, they didn't sing, they didn't speak, they just did kazoos. It was <laughs> astounding from a composer of his magnitude, but he's very um, experimental. Anyway, what's your question? Oh, uh, well, you were talking <laughs> about the uh, use of accidentals and I, and, and you know, say you're in A minor and you're doing a Phrygian thing, wouldn't it still be better to use like a B flat to a G sharp instead of, uh, you were talking about trying to equalize, you know, accidentals. I, I'm kind of a person, if I have a G sharp and I want to write a half step under it, I'll use an F double sharp instead of a G natural. Is that really that bad to use that kind of notation in, uh, you know, choral music? Yes, <laughs> because just make it simpler for singers on all levels. Yes, it's bad. Um, they have to think twice or three times about it, even professionals. I keep talking about professionals because I've had the privilege of working with the best professionals in New York City for decades. And yeah, it confounds them. They have to think, I mean, they can do it, but they're gonna write in their music. You know, they're gonna cross out the F sharp and put a G flat if it's going to be flat. Yeah, there's no reason to make it difficult for the singer in the, as I say, in the, in the piano reduction, you can do whatever you want. Sometimes it doesn't work though, obviously. It just there are situations where you have to do it. I can't think of any at the moment. Um, what about like, say you're writing an augmented sixth chord, for instance, you would, well, G sharp would go one direction and the, the B flat would go the other or something like that. Well, no, no, that's fine. I mean, but, but in, the, in an augmented sixth, you have two different voices supplying the six going to the octave. I mean, you know, unless they have octave transference for some reason. No, I mean, I'm just, no matter what you, what example you give, I'm going to say, if, it's, if you can go from flat to flat or sharp to sharp, do it. I would suggest you change your camera. We're just looking at the top of your head here. Oh, well. I'll let you know the same thing. <laughs> here we go. My camera moved. This is my pandemic non haircut, by the way. Not that I'm usually bald, but this is a little bit unkempt. Anyway, any other que questions while I adjust my camera here? If not, well, yes. One more piece. Oh, uh, thank you, oh, Dr. Sorry. Rosenbaum. For can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, we have two. Oh. Wait, I'm sorry. We yeah. have two. Mr. Lay. We have Kevin Lay and a. Yeah, we're we're twins. Oh my God. Oh. Opposite side of the country, and uh, oh, Kevin told me about this, so I uh, I um, I joined in. So. Uh, wow. I Which my one is uh, better I, looking. <laughs> He's marvelously good looking, don't you think? Anyway. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm... <laughs> um, um, First of all, thank you for doing this. It's very, very kind and generous. Uh, I'm, uh, I noticed on your bio um, uh, that uh, you do conduct with Parma. When you conduct for the Parma recordings, are you using your own choirs or do you, they fly you around to do those recordings? Both. I, I've, uh, I've done one or two recordings in New York City with my New York Virtuoso singers. And I did one recording in, I guess it was Boston, or they flew me up to Boston. And I worked with a professional choir there uh, doing a piece, oh, I forget her name. I, it's one or two tracks on a, a released CD. And then I believe in New York City, um, Alexandra Ottaway, we, we did, yeah, both. And I'm anxious to get back with them because you know there were projects lined up. Right. Marvelous, marvelous company. 
Yeah, yeah, that's good to hear. I know they. I've worked with them too, and they they've just been doing a lot with the crossing and winning a bunch of Grammys over the last couple of years. Yeah. But uh, uh any any uh, suggestions of what to look for on Spotify or to buy a CD that you love that's from Parma? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I I don't know their their rep, you know repertoire. Um, why why uh, of you, things that you've done? Oh, that I've done. Yeah. Well, no, because I've never done, I don't think I've ever done a full CD of theirs uh, mm. with them, only tracks, but I can, I can tell you which CDs I'm most proud of. I have 47 commercial CDs. And <laughs> by the way, I've never made one cent from them. They were all, you know, contemporary music. And I think if, if a recording company sells 2,000 CDs, they consider that a hit. But I do it for the love of it. And uh, my very, very first CD in 1993 called To Orpheus, T-O, To Orpheus, uh, contained some extraordinary music by Henzer and Bill Schumann, who was on my board of advisors. Oh, one of my, my interviews was with uh, Tony Schumann, who talks about his father, the president of Juilliard and Lincoln Center, and a lot of behind the scenes stuff you'd be interested to know. Um, I have I have so many CDs. Uh, there's one a Thea Musgrave CD, two of them. One just came out, uh, but the one we made with Michael York, the actor, narrating a piece, which I feel is her best choral piece, um, for the time being. It's called For the Time Being: Colon uh, Advent, and Michael York is extraordinary. And when I went to meet him before the collaboration, I said I I, I watched. Uh, Logan's Run, the movie where he jumps off this cliff into the water, like so, like a five second descent. And I said, Michael, did you really? Was that really you? He says, Yeah, I was crazy in those days. Um, and the other, the other CD I would say um, is a t called Twenty Five Times Twenty Five. And uh, that in nine years ago, I commissioned twenty five of America's leading composers, including twelve Pulitzer Prize winners, to write. Uh, a piece for my for the 25th anniversary of my uh, professional choir. So there are 25 short pieces there. And I see David Lipton. David is a wonderful composer, wave to everybody. And um, I don't think we have it on a CD, do we, David? But if you want, he wrote two extraordinary pieces, which I'm very happy. We do. David, is it on a CD? I forget. Yes, um, the Hoover disc. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah! I did a, a complete CD of Catherine Hoover's music, and uh, David Lipton and uh, John—I forget the other person, the other composer. Me too. Yeah, but yeah, but well, you know, if we—if all thirty-three of us buy records, maybe maybe it'll get no a little closer to recoup. No. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please. What's, what's that? No, it'll just make you happy because some of this music is so extraordinary and deserves to be heard. Yeah. Some unbelievable music. That, I mean, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, all right. Thank you all for joining us. Um, you please look out for it. Go ahead. Yeah. Read the message, tell your friends about this. Yes. I mean, as you can see, we're quite a full house, but you know, we have we have more spots available. So look out from an email from us on the uh, CV Inc. team, as we like to call ourselves, that will have a sign up for next week. It'll also have the link where you can find all of the archived videos. Um, this one will be on in the next less than 24 hours, usually by the next morning it's on there. And um, those will be yours to look at whenever you want. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye everyone. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.